I'm Justin. I am a critical care PA and I was formerly a paramedic. second episode of Shared Stories of Medicine. Uh, Super excited to have Justin here. I've had the pleasure of working with him in the past and uh, the first PA to be on the program. For those that don't know what that stands for, it is a physician's assistant and it is really cool uh, just learning about what they're capable of and what their training is. So, uh, there's a a lot of different different listeners um, and I think a lot of them are interested in how many different fields of medicine there are. So, Justin, for those listening that want to become a PA, can you just better explain the path, what they have to do to get there, prereqs, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. So, generally speaking, um, the course is a bachelor's degree beforehand. It doesn't really matter what it's in. Um, it can be in, you know, any kind of liberal arts or science degree, but then you have to just qualify for the prereqs. So, you know, if you got a bachelor's degree and then you went back and got the prereqs, which usually include bio one, two, chem one, two, microbio, um, uh, plus or minus organic chemistry, um, usually another couple extra bio classes like genetics or, um, like immunology or something like that. Um, the statistics and uh, a couple of the courses like that. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the PA programs list their prereqs on the website. It's very easy to find that you know what they specifically want, but that's a general idea. Gotcha. Um, so those are the prereqs. And if you get them in your in your bachelor's degree, great. You just have a shorter path. Um, but if you got a bachelor's degree and decide to go back, like oh, I think I want to become a PA, you can always tack them on as long as it's uh, more than like seven years. Um, so, and, so sorry to interrupt. The undergrad yeah. itself does not have to be um, science based. You said it. no, so, no. Okay, as long yeah. as you as long as you check those boxes and you get those prereqs that are required, uh, mm-hmm. are they explicitly listed for each program? Do they say, "Hey, we want biochem, uh, orgo, biochem, etc.," or yes, uh, is it just universal across all programs? It's about like 85% uh, universal. So like okay. what I did when I was um, applying to, when I was made the decision, okay, I want to apply to PA school. I mean, Excel, Excel spreadsheet. I had, okay, each program wants bio, check. Each program wants chem, check. Each program wants micro, check. And then like, then when there was like a misnomer class, like, oh, this one course wanted like a genetics course. This one program wanted a uh, nutrition course. And then I said, okay, I kind of like figured out, okay, I have three programs that want genetics. I'm going to make genetics like high priority where like one program wanted nutrition. So I'm like, I'm, I'll work on nutrition eventually. Um, sure. But if the timeline doesn't line up, I'll just, I'll get to that one, you know. I gotcha. So the undergrad is complete. The prereqs are complete. What does the application process look like? I imagine it's super competitive. Um, you know, this mm-hmm. is a, this is a, a uh, very skilled field that you're working in, and it's obviously not for everybody. So what does the application process itself look like? So besides just the prereqs, of course, work, there's actually also patient contact hours that are required. Okay. Um, so the NCCPA, which is the national like um, accrediting body, well, sir, ARC is the accrediting body for the college programs. They want, gotcha. I believe it's just like 200 hours of contact. I think it's like the bare minimum, but that's... A, most programs require a lot more than that. Uh, I do know for Drexel, um, I know they, they published this on their website. Um, they said most of their competitive applicants have at least 2,000 hours. Wow. Um, about, okay. Yeah. Uh, so you can make the minimums, um, but, you know, there are, you know, if, if you don't make at least 1,000 hours, so you're probably not, you're probably not competitive. Um, gotcha. and then you basically apply, it's, everybody uses this one central website called CASPA. And you upload your application, you know, your resume, your, your course credits, your, your GPA, transcripts, and so on and so forth. How many, you know, patient contact hours you've done in what setting. Um, you'll also do, like, shadowing hours you put on there, volunteering, 
um, any professional associations you're part of. So like a national like PA lobbying board or state one as well, which are, if I'm going to, if anybody's listening, that's definitely um, something you want to try to join. So you can kind of also be informed of like, you know, what issues PAs are facing now. Sure. Um, so when you interview that, you know, kind of prepare for that. And uh, then you send out your application. Application opens in March. Um, and definitely if you're going to be applying, apply early uh, because, you know, they're starting to like look at people right away. So if you're applying, right. you know, if you're, I'm sorry, the application opens in May, closes in March. So if you're applying in like December and it closes in March, most programs have filled their curriculum already, filled their, their rosters already. So, you know, don't expect to get in at that time. Uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, you're not qualified. You know. Right. So super competitive. Um, mm-hmm. You, Statistic I imagine. is actually more competitive. I think last year it was ended up being more competitive than um, med schools. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm sure there's a lot of people gunning for these positions and there's you know, limited programs available uh, as far as the U.S. goes. So once you're completed with all of your prereqs and your applications in uh, panel style interview, or does it vary by school or how, how do they go about uh, gauging whether or not you're qualified? Is there, is there an interview in person or um, anything like that? So uh, 2019, 2020, 21 one might be different with the pandemic. However, when right. I interviewed in 2017, um, it was, you know, uh, in-person interviews. Some people act like for a follow-up, like statements, like the email before you come in, they might want some supplemental information, um, after they offer you an interview. Uh, but then yes, it was a panel style interview. There's usually like a group component to it. I did two mm-hmm. interviews. I did Philadelphia university and Drexel. Sorry. Philadelphia university is now Thomas Jefferson university. Yeah. Um, so then you go, it's like a, it's a group in situ a group interview where you're kind of everybody's in a room talking and it may not seem like an interview formally, uh, but you're talking with faculty, you're talking with other current PA students and it's very subtly an interview. They're seeing how you interact with other people, just making sure, you know, you have like a normal personality and, you know, you're personable and stuff like that. The x-ray dots you, are on at all times. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, but you can definitely see if you look around people in the room who are, for just not comfortable being in that setting for whatever reason. Um, yeah. and you know, um, it, it definitely shows. And it comes like, across. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It, does, it definitely does. Especially if you, <laughs> if you're, if you're aware of it or you're looking for it and then you kind of just fall on to like, you know, different interview people, groups of like, you know, students and then like different faculty and stuff like that. You know? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you get into PA school, you're excited. What, what does the schooling itself, um, look like? How, how long is the program and, uh, what's covered in that program itself? So generally speaking, um, your didactic portion is uh, 12 to 14 months, depending on the program you're going to. Um, and in that part, you're learning everything. You know, one of the favorite parts a lot of people always you know, reflect back on is uh, an anatomy lab. So we had um, donated cadavers. And for people who don't know what cadavers are, is people who have passed um, and they have decided to donate their body to science and medical education. And it is one of the most honorable and grateful things we are like, uh, you know, we have most great appreciation for that in, in medicine because you know, people are donating themselves and what's more selfless than your own body, um, for people yeah, to learn how from. About it. Yeah. So, um, it's a very, very respectful procedure, you know, time we, um, we, we don't know their names. Um, we give them, we give them fake names. Um, so this way we had, to, it's, it's very personable because we spend weeks and weeks and weeks dissecting them, um, and learning every muscle vessel, you know, tendon, you know, nerve that's in their body. Um, and we dissect them and then we, you know, take exams with them and, you know, it definitely does help clinically later, um, when you can visualize and remember like, okay, this is where this vessel goes and it cuts under the rib and so on and so forth. So it definitely is a big part, very fun. Um, outside of that, there is, um, you know, there's a physiology, there's a little bit of physiology, but that you learn, you know, mostly there's a physiology and pathology course. Um, so you go through that and then, you know, start learning like how to diagnose and then treat. And then, you know, there's later in the years, you know, there's a physical exam course, you know, okay. All right. I think this patient has, I don't know, a pulmonary embolism. Here's how I would like, you know, here's how you would look for that. Here's signs and symptoms. And, you know, that's when you actually like start touching, you know, like, and like physically assessing like a healthy person, like you're like a classmate. 
Uh, and then you go like, and then later in the year, there's like physical, uh, like skills, um, on top of your other clinical work on top of your other coursework. So like we had like emergency medicine, um, course where we learned how to do casting and stitching right. and injections and intubations, um, and so on and so forth. Do you do case-based studies where you split into groups and, uh, maybe a professor gives you. Uh, something like a like a particular case that they may have experienced themselves, and you work through it systematically, and yes. you learn about that that pathophysiology or that body system through uh, a complex case. Or I, I think yes, yeah. There's a, I know I know med schools. A lot of med schools have moved to that as like their entire curriculum. Sure. Like in, from my, from my understanding, I believe like not all, but some schools are moving to like everything they learn about is essentially like a case. And they learn like top to bottom and like that's the pathology and treatment yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, for us, it's still a little more traditional where like here it is, but there is, um, we do get like one course per semester where it's like that, where you're learning, okay, like here's your case. Okay. Here your patient comes in with this. And then you kind of work through it. Usually, um, I think it's as a group, um, and you kind of work through things together and like, okay, like what test would we want to order? Okay. Why wouldn't we want to order this? And like, Oh, are we sure we want to order this really, really expensive MRI when the guy just came in with back pain? You know, like, right. can we, can we see like, did we, he like, did he strain it? You know, does it get better with a little bit of like, you know, ice and ibuprofen, you know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, so then we kind of, you know, work through that and then we're like, all right, well, you know, this is you Sometimes, you know, you find out like, uh, you know, that was actually a really good process of like why you went down that path. And then you're like, Nope. That was, you know, unnecessary and expensive and actually harmful to the patient because they got a biopsy for back pain, you know, yeah. or something, you know, like that's unnecessary. So right. Um, when your schooling is complete, I imagine it so is it one year, two years? How does that work? Okay. So yeah, I forgot to I didn't cut touch on that. So no, after that's fine. Your one year, well, your one year of didactic, you know, in your classroom stuff. Sure. Then you get one year of um clinical experience. Um, okay. Generally speaking. So for me, I had, um, it was 10, eight, eight rotations and they were all like six weeks long. Um, essentially it ended up being about 2000 hours of, um, of, of cl clinical experience. Wow. And this is just yeah. rotating around hospitals. Yep. So I wrote I've rotated in hospitals. I rotated in a lot of outpatient locations. I actually, um, got to go down to Maryland. They had my, they actually covered my housing. Um, and I rotated in a pediatric outpatient office, which is good. It's always good to see different culture than other yeah, than where you, sure. you maybe grew up and learned a lot. Of, we actually have an association with a hospital in Mississippi and a lot of people got to go down there and learn, which is really cool. Cause it's very rural. So it's like, you know, they're limited, their resources are limited. So you really get to do a lot. Yeah. Um, which is great. And they really appreciate having students. Um, so there's, there's a lot of cool opportunities to rotate. Do you pick and choose your electives as far as rotations go or? Yes. So for electives, we, I got to choose, um, I believe I chose emergency medicine and trauma and I got to do trauma at a local Philadelphia hospital, which is fantastic. Um, it was trauma surgery and trauma intensive care unit. No shortage uh, here. Yeah. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> um, and, uh, so then I got to, after doing the ICU, it's really kind of one of things that like really drew me just to, to push in that direction. Um, but then, you know, uh, my emergency medicine rotation didn't get happen. Uh, my second one, right. Cause I got to do a, a elective, I'm sorry, the core emergency medicine rotation, uh, part of my regular rotations. And then I didn't get to do the second one because of COVID, but you know, um, I still have plenty of emergency medicine experience prior to that. Yeah. I, I know you mentioned earlier that you have experience as a paramedic. Uh, the first episode that I, I, uh, created was with Astro paramedic. Um, is there anything similar to, uh, so I know there's EMS physicians, are there pre-hospital physicians assistants or PAs? Um, so I believe in the state of Pennsylvania, they are, a, there is actually a, like a certification for board okay. certified pre-hospital, like min levels, which is uh, the, the kind of group all term sometimes for PAs and, and nurse practitioners. Um, I don't know the role in Pennsylvania. I haven't seen much on them. I did look into it a little bit because I am interested in somehow yeah. uh, amending the two. I know a couple like rural areas, I think um, like somewhere in, out in California and like somewhere out in like Nevada or Arizona, they have some pre-hospital PAs or NPs going out to houses essentially telling patients, you know, okay, you don't need to go to the hospital for this. This is not a critical illness where the ER is necessary. Here's an appointment for uh, whatever. 
That's awesome. Um, that that is yeah. uh that is really cool. I, I like seeing things like that evolve. One of the one of the future episodes is going to have an EMS fellow uh, physician, and um, it is really interesting to learn about that that additional training that most people don't even know exists because it, mm-hmm. it is fairly new from what I understand. But when you completed PA school, is there like a national accreditation, a, a board exam. What is it that you have to take that says, okay, you are now, you know, uh, you have your master's, you're a PAC. So there's a national board exam from the NCCPA. Um, okay. And it's issued uh, through like these like testing companies like Pearson View. Um, you sit for the board exam, I believe. Oh gosh, I can't remember. I just took it. It was like, like 500 questions. So it takes a couple hours to do. Um, it takes like four to like six hours, depending how long, you know, how quickly you go through your questions. Um, and then after that, you are board certified and wow. that board certify, you know, the national, it's in like a national board, um, with that certification, you can't actually practice. You just, then you then take that, you know, here's my, here's my credential. And then you send that information to, uh, your state licensing board and then they issue license. And, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, paperwork to go to each state, but it's good throughout the all 50 states. How long do you wait after you took the test to find out I'm certified? This is it. I'm uh, done. That, that's actually a pretty quick process. It's actually like about a week, week and a half. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know if that's quick. I feel like, um, I mean, I'm surprised you have such a full head of hair. I feel like I would be whipping my hair out for a week straight, seven <laughs> days is, counting down. Oh you my know, gosh. Even 24 very, hours very seems like it's a lot. Anxiety inducing. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the cool thing about what they do is, um, it's, good, it's glad you brought that up because they actually, the reason why that takes that time, instead of saying, okay, you've made, you know, 80% of your score, here's your cr- credential. Um, they actually compare, they're actually always changing out questions. Okay. So they actually compare your score that day in comparison with the national average. Like, okay, did we put down a question in this day? Because everybody on the same day gets the same same test throughout the mm-hmm. whole country. Um, did on this day we put in a question, like I'm a question number 234, that really was not word or right. And, you know, 97% of patient people got it wrong and the only 3% was just by chance. So we're not going to count that question for everybody because it's not fair. I like that. So they, they, yeah. they curve it and okay. Yeah. yeah I like yeah. that a lot. Um, that makes a lot of sense. You know what? That's, that's probably worth the wait quite honestly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's fair. That's a really, uh, that's a really good way of doing things. Now that you are done, you're, you're completed. Um, you're, you're not a, a, a neurotic student anymore. You get to kind of <laughs> relax and enjoy doing what you do. Where exactly do you work? I, I know there's, um, maybe people don't realize this, there's a lot of different uh, specialties that PAs can, can practice in, and maybe you can speak to that and then tell us what it is you uh, do as a physician's assistant. So, um, so as a uh, it's actually a physician assistant. Uh, it's actually not physician's assistant. It's kind of like a, oh, a misnomer. Oh, oh, I see. Physician. Yeah, yeah. Physi- yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, we're not like it's because, and it's like a, it's kind of just like a verbiage thing that you know people. Some people aren't a huge fan of because it sounds like we are like owned by the physician. You know, what I mean? right? Yeah. Um. But yeah. So we I typically say jobs, PA. Yeah, yeah. I, sorry, I, mean, to I, I typically say yeah. PA, and um, yeah. I, I feel like people think I'm abbreviating Pennsylvania or something like that when I say PA. It's, yeah, it's hard because we live yeah. in, the, in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. So yeah, <laughs> you, I always like have to think of myself. I'm like, oh, PA, okay, not the yeah, state. Yeah. 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 All right. Awesome. So so yeah, every job, pretty much most jobs that a physician does, um, a physician assistant will also perform. Um, usually outside of like the high end like administrative roles. Uh, so your primary care doc, um, PAs also work in primary care. Um, and in that setting, um, you know, you come in, you're going to see the PA or the doc, um, you're going to present to them your issue, your, you know, what happened, why it's going, you know, any medications you're taking, and they may or may not order x-rays or a CAT scan or a blood test, a urine test, and the, and the PA is going to prescribe you medicine and then you don't have to see the doctor. Yeah. And, you know, our education is obviously not as inclusive as, you know, physicians school. It's their school is uh, about twice as long as ours, but, you know, we learn enough of disease and pathology and illness to treat most things. Um, For sure. And as, you know, time goes on, you get more common, uh, you see things more and more often, you can, you get more confident, you can 
you know, treat more things without going to your physician. Because if something is overhead, most of the time, we are very good at acknowledging this and saying, okay, this is out of my hands. I'm going to go to my supervising doctor who I work with and say, what do you think about this? You know, and they may say, oh, that's actually a really, really strange case. I don't know. I'm actually going to have to, you know, think about that one and bring somebody else on. Or then they're going to tell you, like, that's maybe oh, just a weird presentation of something that's common. You know what I mean? So yeah. you have that collaboration with your with the doctor who you work with um, in every setting. You know? Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like consults are just a, a healthy part of uh, medicine, having everything be an open forum discussion. That's not unique to just PAs. I, I feel yeah. like, you know, physicians Absolutely. constantly consult specialists. That's what they're there for. Absolutely. Like I work in the um, intensive care unit, right? Um, and, you know, my right now I'm learning a lot of information that's not taught in PA school because TA, PA school has to teach you a lot of the basics and, you know, the core information that you would be able to do in like a primary care office. My stuff is very kind of nuanced and, um, for the very critically and ill patients. Um, but with consults, I talk to consultants every single day. I talk to nephrologists, you know, kind yeah. of cardiologists, you know, we are essentially the pulmonologists and, you know, treat a lot of other diseases. Um, but I'm always speaking to other consults, you know, um, intense, um, interventional radiology, you know, the list goes on. So it sounds like PAs can essentially function in every specialty or subspecialty. Um, I feel like every every floor of a hospital that you could visit, there's more than likely a PA, right? Yes. I, yeah. I, I feel like the, the specialties are endless. Do you have to complete additional training beyond your schooling to work at that specialty or is it on, on-site on training when you apply to the job and you get it, you learn? Great question because there are some, but not many. Um, so for like emergency medicine, there are residency programs or fellowship programs, which is kind of like the same thing um, for PAs, but it's not required. So say you either get into a job that is very willing to teach you and they're just going to teach you on the job for emergency medicine. Sure. Great. You may be new, a new PA and they're going to teach you and you'll be fine. Um, other people have a structured um and a structured program for like emergency medicine residency. And they will, you know, okay. Like every week, say like two weeks, you're gonna have like a, maybe like not a test, but like they'll like have like a lecture. Um, and then, you know, there's basically, you have like a mentor that's teaching you go through the process. Um, and for me, although I'm, I'm in the critical, I'm in the critical care. I don't have, I'm not in a residency, um, which residencies, you know, the caveat, they always come with a little less pay. Cause you know, you're, Sure. You're looking to you're looking to somebody, you know, to for like everything you're doing through the process. Right. I have a very, very um well structured like onboarding system. So I have a lot of people I can go to. So it's great that um I got I got very lucky in my position. Yeah, how about it? Um working you mentioned you work in the ICU. Uh, mm. Can you maybe talk about that floor of the hospital? What type of patients you see? I think everybody's at one point in their life or watching TV or, uh, you know, has a relative that has been in ICU. They have a general idea of what it is, but maybe you could you could touch on exactly what kind of patients you see. Sure, sure. So the I work in the medical ICU. Um, there are multiple different types of ICUs in the hospital. Go for as far as in general ICU in, in, in general. Um, if you've landed into the ICU, it's because you are um, very what we call critically ill. You know, you are essentially um, on the maximum types of medicines that are essentially supporting your life. We're usually either, you know, supporting your blood pressure through something, you know, because your blood pressure is too low, either your heart is not functioning or you have a really, really bad infection that's causing, you know, your, your body to kind of shut down. So we have to give you medicine to support that through it. You're getting heavy dose IV antibiotics. You know, it's likely that you may be on a ventilator, which is the, um, machine that everybody's heard about with COVID, um, where you have a century breathing tube down your throat. Um, and we have to deliver oxygen to you and we have, you know, many different modes for that um, to make sure you're giving the correct amount of oxygen and correct amount of like breaths to you. Um, Then you may be on what's called um, dialysis, but you may need a special kind of dialysis called um, slow diet. Like it's called sled. It's like a slow dialysis um, where a normal dialysis session is like two to four hours where for us, it's going to be like 10 hours. And that's because your kidneys are essentially failing and we're doing the work for your kidneys in this very acutely ill setting. So basically all these different kind of illnesses that are landing you that are like, essentially, I would hate to kind of be frank, but like knocking on death's door, potentially um, yeah. we're trying to keep, you know, keep, keep the door shut. And, and it seems like it's um, 
pretty diverse. It, I, I feel like what you just described is the sickest of the sick. This is where, yeah. you know, um, no matter what issue is going on or what, you know, body system is failing, they mm-hmm. have, you know, a chance of ending up in the medical ICU. You, you just yeah. see, you see it all is what it sounds like. It, it basically yeah. sounds like an extension of the emergency department. When yeah. they, show, they show up and they're critically ill in the emergency department uh, yeah. and they're so sick, they can't be discharged from there. It sounds like they just, they go to you in the medical ICU. Yeah, it's pretty much a great summary of it. It's kind of what, what one of the things that drew me to it, because like you said, we've talked about before, like I was a paramedic before this, and, you know, those very sick patients who are very complex is really what drew, like, what interested me the most. And that's why I wanted to kind of continue on it, because my, my perspective was like, okay, I saw this in, before the hospital. I kind of know what goes on inside the ER, but then what happens, like, this mass, this mystical place above the, above the ground floor, right? Like, that's what's like, what goes on up there? And then, uh, you, you know, you get the really whole puzzle. You get the whole puzzle and that is yeah. that is you know really really intriguing that you you know what it's like uh seeing the beginning you know going mm-hmm. into the eaten and battered homes or mm-hmm. uh you know somebody's private residence or business and you've seen where it starts how it starts what their environment was and now you get to see it all the way through uh because yeah. you're right you know astro spoke about this in the first episode that the cooperation between the emergency department and paramedics is fairly intimate. Yes. When he drops off a patient, he gets follow-up. He gets to, uh, you know, maybe stick around, help out with interventions and whatnot, mm-hmm. and then see where they land after they leave the emergency department or get admitted to a floor. So you yep. get the unique opportunity to see it all. And I'm glad you brought up that you were a paramedic previously because maybe other paramedics listening to this uh, can can relate um, with you and are interested in what you have to say. Maybe you can tell them what it is that got you interested in becoming a PA. Mm-hmm. So when I was in paramedic school, um, you know, I was like, this is really great information, but I was so hungry for more. I yeah. was really hungry for more information. And I was like, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. And like emergency medicine was interesting to me, but I'm like, I want to know more. And I was very hungry for it. Um, so I decided like, okay, I'm going to do something else after this, but I don't think I want to do nursing, which we have a lot of colleagues of, or of ours who become paramedics and they go to nursing. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to do nursing and I'm not knocking nurses at all. They are the, you know, the heroes of the hospital and, you know, they really do you know, these are a lot of credit. Um, it just wasn't something that I saw myself doing. Can, can, um, real quick. Can you imagine being so slimy that you trash talk a nurse? <laughs> like who, who would actually belittle a nurse? Uh, yeah. You know, who's just yeah. working and doing their job and, and being, you know, a crucial part of the team. But anyway, no. sorry. I, I just, that always blows my mind that we like, yeah. we have to give a disclaimer. Like I'm not knocking nurses at all, but I didn't want to be one. That's totally fine. There's, yeah. You know, there's people that are great at it and that's what they've wanted their entire lives. And yeah. they do a phenomenal job and everybody loves a nurse. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, you know, they, they really do some incredible work. And in the ICU, just a caveat, they're the ones who are seeing the patients more than I am. Yeah. They are getting, they are getting the full gown, the, the mask, the, 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 the eye protection, the whole nine, getting into the patient's rooms, seeing them, you know, every two hours, you know, as these patients are taking, you know, their last you know, dying breaths, they're the ones who are bedside by them, you know? So, um, yeah. But, so you were, it sounds like you were bored. And and I think a lot of people can relate. You are smart. Paramedic school was fun. Paramedic school was good. It was enjoyable being a paramedic. But you, uh, it sounds like you were frustrated. Like you uh, you hit a brick wall as far as knowledge and autonomy goes. Maybe you you just wanted to do more and know more. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of what pushed me in that direction. And I don't and like any paramedic or EMT who's thinking myself like you know, they want more and, you know, they think, you know, they don't think they're good enough. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you're good enough, you know, get a bachelor's degree. It doesn't yeah. take as long as you think it does. You know, there's a lot of, especially if you're working in, you know, um, in like a hospital in New Jersey where we, you know, I worked for many years, you know, a lot of them have like tuition reimbursement. So it could be cheaper even to go to, you know, get a college degree and then, you know, go to paramedic school. Um, I'm sorry, PA school. And trust me, before you know it in a flash, you know, you'll, you'll be, you'll be done and working, you know, whatever specialty you want to work. Yeah. And maybe people who work in EMS that are listening to this uh, can can get this info and 
uh, move on or stay in EMS. But when you become a PA, nothing says you can't still work as a paramedic, right? Did you still work as a paramedic? So I actually have not worked, but that's only, I would say only because I'm like bombarded with, uh, that and like life things. Cause I did just sure. uh, move. Um, but I did just recertify my paramedic, uh, as of this year. Um, I do plan on trying to get back in the truck a little bit and, you know, you just, can, yeah. just, you, yeah, you can, I can still, still work as a paramedic and, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nothing yeah. is saying that you can't do both. Correct. Correct. Uh, and that's, that's, that's good to know. Once you became a physician's assistant, I know you said you, uh, or I'm sorry, physician assistant. I, I keep screwing that up. Uh, once you became a PA, that's how we'll fix it. I'm just going to say PA from now on, and it's not Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, once you once you became a PA, did you have uh, any plans of moving out of the country, or were you always going to stay in the U.S. to practice? My intent was always to stay in the U.S., um, there are only PAs that I know of. I believe Canada may have PAs, and I believe the UK may have. Uh, they just started the first PA program okay. recently. Um, I don't know of. I don't know of PAs roles outside of there. Um, you know, maybe in like third world countries, you may get you know like a lot of privileges and kind of just you know because they're in need of resources. Yeah. Um, and when that does happen. You know, not to say that you know like we're enable to uh, provide medicine, but you know, they may not have an actual definition or like understand what a PA is. This is, so, this is a uh, position that is most unique to the United States. It sounds like yes. it's not. Okay. Yes. I didn't know yes. that. I actually didn't know yep. that. Yep. And I think there's def- there is an international group that is lobbying for us to start, you know, um, you know, expanding our position in other countries. Right. Um, but for the most part, it's just in the United States. Okay. Now, you've been working on the medical ICU since you've become a PA, since you, I mean, did you have connections before you got certified uh, or before you passed your board exam? Did you have an in at the hospital or did you have to wait until you got news that you're, you, you have passed to apply? How did that work? So I actually started applying um, pretty early. I started apply. I graduated in August. And I tested in August and I started applying and making um, my application out there in March. And people are, will tell you like, that is like really early. Um, yeah. But it did pan out because, um, you know, only a few of us out of the class had jobs at graduation. Um, but, you know, I was, you know, but I, March may have been even a little early. You know, if I could, you could, I could have started in like say May or so. Um, and March was just a unique situation because I happened to be on a rotation where somebody was leaving a job um, mm-hmm. and I happened to like talk to them and they liked me. So I applied and I actually got the position. I lost it because of COVID. So I did some reconfiguring. Um, but, you know, applying, you know, two, three, four, five months before you graduate is great. Yeah. Start making networking, you know, while you're out there, you know, you know, these people, you know, jobs are a lot of jobs are made not based, I hate to say this, but not based on your merits. Obviously, you know, your grades do matter to a degree, but like nobody's looking at transcripts, you know, um, it's about, you know, do people like you, you know, when you graduate, everybody expects, you know, you're going to have a base level of education and the kind of, you know, if you have anything beyond that, that's great. But, you know, it's really, you know, are you, do you fit with the team? Yeah. And you, I mean, I feel like any, any part of medicine requires you to not be socially inept. I, I mean, if you're just, you know, uh, incapable of basic human interaction, I feel yeah. like you're, you're not going to be a strong candidate for, for any position in any field of medicine. So Absolutely. you have to be a people person. When you were doing your rotations, did you, did you make connections at all? Yeah, absolutely. I made connections. Um, you know, you make connections, you know, you people, you click with people, you know, people end up like offering one of the best things people you can get while you're in school or in your rotations is people, um, offering to be a reference because that is yeah. them sticking their neck out. Right. So, you know, you make sure you make, you make your connections, you get their personal emails, professional emails, you know, phone numbers, this way, you know, when time comes, you know, you have their email contact information for references because yeah. when you apply to a hospital, they will want, you know, professional references from people who know you as a PA student, not just, you know, people who know you as a friend, you know, for so many years. So they're going to essentially stick their neck out to, um, to say, yes, he's a good person. He's a good provider. I would trust him with my family member. 
So, um, you know, I feel like that's that's a word to the wise. Anybody that wants to go to PA school when you're doing rotations uh, and you're a student still, show up to play ball. You know, absolutely. Be, be ready to matter. learn. Be ready to get hands on. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't matter if you're going to show to a specialty. I, you know, if you ask, you know, um, as a general statement, um, most men don't are not pursuing gynecology or obstet- obst- um, obstetrician, but on my GYN rotation, I had one of the best times because I had a preceptor that was um, very open to teaching and she allowed a lot of like free range. You know, I didn't do anything, you know, clinically and doing exams on, you know, unsupervised, but, you know, um, she allowed me to drive a lot of the treatment. Um, and, you know, you know, if I hit something that like was not appropriate, obviously she would, she would stop me, but like, she really allowed me a lot of free range. And I had one of the best times at that rotation because, you know, she just, you know, she was a great connection. Um, and that, became a great reference, you know, yeah. um, I, you know, I, but you know, any reference you get is great. And you know what? It probably made it far more enjoyable for her as a preceptor. Um, Absolutely. She was probably 10 times more willing to teach when you showed her you wanted to be taught. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, yeah. there's they, and that goes for every rotation. Yeah. You know, I didn't really have an interest in psychology, but I should have ready to learn, ready to, you know, treat my patients. And, you know, if, if you ever think like, okay, I want to do say ICU, but I'm not interested in psychology. I'm sure there's something in the, in your psychology rotation that's going to be important to you. Like say delirium for me, right? Cause we have yeah. a lot of patients in the ICU that develop delirium. So I'm going to pay attention to everything. Cause I want to make sure I recognize delirium. I want to make sure I recognize depression because this depression is also a popular thing, you know? So like there is something to learn, you know, in every rotation. So, Always. You know, go, with it, go with it ready to learn. That's really good advice. Uh, on your medical ICU, I uh, just, you know, rewinding a little bit to you talking about COVID putting a wrench in your um, application cycle for, for employment afterwards. How has the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic affected you and your coworkers? Because I imagine the medical ICU, uh, are you not, see- I-, I imagine you're seeing COVID patients, yes? Pretty much the medical ICU is the COVID unit. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it sounds like that's where the people who go on a ventilator end up, right? Yep. Yep. Um, if you're like a sur- if you have a surgical, you know, critical illness, say like you're, you're tra- you hit, you get hit by a bus or something like that. And then you, you end up in the tr- surgery, you end up in the surgical ICU, but you know, COVID, um, and pulmonary diseases is the medical ICU. That's, and, yeah. uh, out of our 20 some odd 20, like low 20 beds, like 22 beds, um, at any point in time, 80 to 90% of them are COVID. And we've actually had to expand and borrow beds from uh, other ICUs to take care of our regular illnesses, such as like DKA, which is a diabetic ketoacidosis um, and other diseases. We have to take borrow beds in the cardiac ICU to take care of patients there because we're so filled with COVID patients. Yeah. I mean, that, and this is mid-January now that we're we're uh, taping this and you, you heard it first, the... Uh, the pandemic is still a very real thing. Uh, cases are spiking and beds are short everywhere in the country. Uh, yeah. Wear your mask. <laughs> wear your mask. Stop yeah, going please. out and partying. And uh, please, please, please. Yeah. It's not. And I, and I like. I. It's. It's not. It's you know, people our age. You know. You know, in our twenties and thirties. You know, we are not the ones that are usually going to be end up being the ICU. Although I have seen plenty of people in the ICU like that. Um, you know, but it's, it's the older people who are going to end up contracting it and they don't do well. Yeah. You, know, it, you They don't do well. I have had plenty of people in their fifties and even low or like early sixties that are otherwise we, they think they're pretty healthy and they end up in the ICU and they do not do well. They how is this, die. how is this affecting you personally or your coworkers or just everybody? I mean, is this putting strain on the, uh, on the situation or is it just, you know, another day at the office and, and nobody's really affected or, uh, are, are people getting kind of burned out? What, what's going There's on with that? Absolutely burnout. Um, because it's people don't do well with COVID who end up in the ICU. If they, if they get to the ICU, they often are not doing well. Um, you know, they, you know, a lot of them die. It's very high mortality when they get to the, they get to the hour level. Um, we are, you know, not doing the same things we were doing at the beginning, like in debating patients like we were, um, you know, we've, you know, we've changed some practices um, and that is saving some people, but not everybody. A lot of people, you know, we wore off intubation for many, many, many days as far as we can until the point where like their body, there's, we've, we've run about absolutely every action and they don't do well and people are exhausted and it's, 
become very um I'm not looking for a sympathy card, but it's, it's very mundane. Okay. And when we present a patient on rounds, which is when we all talk about it, all the patients in the ICU, um, the patient has COVID pneumonia, they have septic shock, their kidneys are failing. And, you know, they received, you know, remdesivir and tocilizumab and, and high dose steroids and like, um, and they're just, and they're not making progress. But there's you know? no, there's no way as a human, you can just be, robotic about it no matter how oh, much experience it, you have yeah. it has to be emotionally draining to uh know wow we've hit a brick wall uh you know yeah what else is there to do how can we help uh mm-hmm. and then i imagine it's it's super stressful having family members not able to visit right oh my gosh yeah that is a you know culturally like i showed up in the time of covid so things are very different. They told me of these fantastical times when people used to be in the ICU all day and night, you know, family members. Now we yeah. have to do phone calls and FaceTiming. And, you know, basically right at this point, we are allowing people to come into the ICU. But usually when the, we believe the pe- people have like 24 hours to live, when we were kind of exhausting like all treatments and like, you know, they're not responding to anything anymore, then we've allowed two people come in. And that's it. That is depressing. Um, yeah. When they come in, those two people, are they allowed to be in the room or are they staring through glass? Depends on the situation. Um, if the person is still in like the window of like potentially infective COVID, like less than two weeks or we're extending it out to three weeks, um, they are not usually allowed in. Um, if the person, if the visitor is quite young, um, like in their thirties or, you know, um, even as late as like forties. So we may consider them, allow them go in if they sign a waiver and they wear, you know, PPE that we will provide to them. They can masks, they can spend some time, but generally speaking, unfortunately it's through the glass window. So they're essentially looking at their family members through like a glass bowl, which is nightmare heart wrenching to hear. Um, and they, we have to put a curtain around them so they can have some privacy. Which is- you, you're not even, it's not even your family and it's heart wrenching. I'm not even there. Yeah. I'm not even in your job on your floor. I'm not even there. Yeah. And that's like absolutely depressing uh, and heart wrenching. I think anybody who's not a robot would uh, have their soul crushed by the idea. It is. Yeah. So uh, I think, I think that's a good brief view into how messed up the pandemic is is uh making your job and how stressful it's making your job and i don't want to i don't want to depress people too much that are listening uh so (laughs) let's let's go to uh thank you for sharing that information by the way because i I think it is important that people know you know covid is very much real and very much still happening but absolutely let's go to positives what is what is something about being a PA that you cherish? What, what about this job? Like really, really, uh, hits a good spot, you know, makes you feel good. Um, so for me, I would say two things. Um, a, um, when I love to do procedures, that's why I went to the ICU because there were a lot of procedures to be performed to, you know, try to save somebody's life. Um, so like yesterday, I, last night at, 1 30 in the morning before I was leaving. Um, I did a central line meeting. I stuck with an ultrasound. I stuck a needle into somebody's neck and I put an art, I put a, um, a needle guided by the ultrasound into a, um, internal jugular vein, which leads directly to the heart. It's very close to the heart. It's about 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters away, um, guided a wire through it and put a catheter and put like essentially a long IV that tr- trickles medicine into like their heart. And that was, you know, it's very That's amazing. You know, yeah, it's a very as as a clinician, it's a very rewarding thing to do. Once you pass it through and you see it on the ultrasound, then you confirm with the chest X, right? It's a very rewarding thing to do, and like there's a lot of procedures like that to have, and I thoroughly enjoy doing like, things like that. And I'm not torturing anybody because obviously I'm, you know, they're being medicated and they're being, you know, uh, they get some lidocaine in the area. But you know, it, these are these are interventions that are potentially going to be saving these people's lives. Um, yeah. So that's something I thoroughly enjoy. And these are, these are you know things advanced and far beyond the scope of when you're a paramedic. So you get to, you get to amp up those skills to the next level. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. For, and I get to, you know, take some skills to the paramedics who are listening. I do get to take some skills that I did do outside um, and bring them inside. Um, not only do I do peripheral IVs, you know, which we all you know do as paramedics, but I do ultrasound guided IVs. 
um, you know, so, you know, arteries that are veins or veins that are, you know, deep into the, into the bicep or deep into the forearm, I can, you know, place IVs there. Um, and I, you know, I haven't got to do intubation yet, but I will be doing intubation soon, um, in the ICU, um, just because it's just like a training thing, like in the timeline that's later on, cause that's a, you know, obviously more advanced skill for most people. Um, on, you know, we're quite, you know, we're quite good at intubating people, you know, as paramedics. Um, yeah. so, but that, yeah, uh, is, that will, that will is... translate later. Fairly unique. Yeah. You, you're, you're, you, you have to be the stud amongst the, the other PAs. You got, you got a leg up on them. Um, I feel like having all that experience with hands-on skills, you had no qualms whatsoever, just jumping in and getting dirty, uh, so to speak, as far Absolutely. as procedures yeah, go. It's, it's, I'm very, very comfortable with, with tools in my hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, uh, and it's, you know, everybody, you know, I work with, you know, PAs who've been doing this for, you know, that will run circles around me, obviously, um, I'm brand new. Um, and you know, the other new PAs, you know, they will get, you know, they will get very comfortable very quickly too, you know, cause there is plenty, there's no shortage of procedures to be done. Um, for sure. You know, I just, on my first, my first time I'm very comfortable, you know, usually. Anybody that's not a procedure junkie. Yes. Uh, some, some people, some people, you know, really enjoy the other aspects of medicine. What is something not procedure related that you, you really like about being a PA? Um, so another thing I would say definitely is the pathology. Like I like to, um, I like to like think about the disease, the disease processes, you know, not everybody's going to, you know, if you say you're on internal medicine floor, like a regular medicine floor, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily going to have to do a lot of procedures, but these patients may have very complex disease and they take a lot of thinking and a lot of like collaboration with other people to kind of figure out what's going on. And it's very, it was very interesting. And even you know, my floor, the medicine floor, you know, cardiac floor, you know, to see what's going on. How can I fix this? What do I need to do? It's kind of like, like the hardest puzzle of your life, you know? Yeah. That's a really good way to describe it. Because as you were talking, I thought to myself, it sounds like a really interesting puzzle. And uh, I enjoy puzzles. So I think mm-hmm. other people that enjoy puzzles might like that aspect of it as well. Piecing yeah. everything together. And, and there's a lot of things to consider. And I'm sure there's a lot of uncertainties as well, which is, you know, like you said, it's good you have specialists and consults and everything like mm-hmm. that. When you're yeah. done, you, you so you just finished a shift last night. Yes. Okay. What time did you get off? I got out at 2 a.m. No, we, we could have rescheduled. I feel, <laughs> I, I, I feel bad. I feel bad. No, did no, no. This, is, this is my between time. I have, a, I have a shift. I go back in today at, at I leave here at two for my, uh, I leave here at like two thirty for my shift at four. So I have time. This is my between shift time. All right. I slept well. Just don't, I'm don't good. sacrifice sleep for, for a podcast, but I appreciate it. No, no, no. I'm glad you're We're here. Um, when you're done, what do you, aside from sleep and uh, wake up and uh, come on my podcast, what do you, what do you do to wind down? There has to be things outside of medicine. You have to turn it off, right? Of course. Of course. Uh, I found, um, you know, you got, you got to you need a hobby. <laughs> um, yeah. and whether that, so for me, that's, uh, two things. Well, I haven't done it in the one thing in a while. I used to, I started running a lot, uh, especially when I lived in Philly, you know, we used to run along the Schuylkill river with my buddy. Um, and that was a great endorphin release. And man, it doesn't matter if you are running like a 15 minute mile, just yeah. a jog, just to, just to get your heart rate going a little bit. Um, you know, for one mile and then next week, you know, try to push yourself to a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half, you know, it's, it's, it's um, euphoric, to be honest, to run. Seriously. Um, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do now. Um, but the other thing I like to do is I do like woodworking. I've built uh, some tables. You know, um, I do a lot of construction around my house. You know, like I just, my apartment in Philly, I just remodeled the bathroom. And, you know, I'm not saying, you know, everybody has to get out there and remodel a bathroom, but, you know, like a little bit, little, little hobby goes a long way. You know, something yeah, you can construct with your hands to kind of like essentially, like you said, turn your mind off, you know, grab, grab some sanding paper and just, you know, go out with some wood. I find woodworking <laughs> extremely therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Put on some music. Yes. Get the table out. Mm-hmm. Get a router. Get a sander. Mm-hmm. Get some stain, whatever. Refinish a piece of furniture. Even something Absolutely. as simple as restaining, you know. Absolutely. Turn it down, restain it finish it with some, some polyurethane, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, That is very therapeutic, uh, especially if you, you have the space to do it and you have absolutely thick. So woodworking and, uh, working out, 
I, I couldn't agree more. Those are those are two really, really good ways to kind of wind down after what sounds like an extremely stressful time to work uh, as a PA in a medical ICU. So mm-hmm. anybody listening that wants to become a PA, obviously it's an awesome idea. Uh, it is really, really interesting. It sounds like you get to do a lot of really cool things. You are kind of fresh, but not really fresh. You have some experience and you have some experience at a really uh, strange time, I would say. Mm-hmm. Working during the pandemic, you see not only sick people, but really, really sick COVID patients as well. So anybody listening that wants to become a PA, give them advice. What is, what is what are some some big things to take away, or just one big thing, one one word of wisdom from Justin? Um, it's a it's a long path, um, but it can be done. Um, don't don't doubt yourself. Um, don't worry about like the, some people concerned about the finances of it. There's loans, and you know you know I'm not doing this entirely for the money. Um, I'm doing this for the my 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 love of like medicine and treating people and trying to figure out their disease. And if this is something that you want to do, you want to move, you know, move up in, in medicine from being an EMT or a uh, CNA or um, a paramedic, go for it. You know, um, it's it, the opportunity is there. There's plenty of jobs out there for PAs. It actually, like two days ago, um, PA was ranked number one on the USA Today uh, job list for 2021. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and you know, not just people that work it. in medicine. If you're, you know, a, uh, yeah. if you're an accountant and you're sick yes. of it. Yes, absolutely. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. So, so for people that want to become a PA, I think they can take all of the information you gave them and work with it. And I yeah. think they'll, they'll, they'll appreciate the insight as well. So they can hear yeah. how cool it is. I don't think, I don't think many people really under uh, understand what a PA even is. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's an issue because they are so common. Yes. People don't even realize it. I mean, how yeah. often you were mentioning earlier, how often does somebody go to primary care? They don't even realize they're seeing a PA. You know what I mean? It's and that's, that's very really often. Common. Yeah. It's uh, very, so. very often. So it's good yeah. for people to know. It's good for people to know. It's a it's a fantastic career and a really, really cool path. And you get to do a lot of really cool things. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate you being on the podcast. I think you should probably uh, chill out, maybe eat some food, get some relaxation yeah. in before you shift tonight. I exactly. again, yeah. cannot thank you enough for coming on uh, with what little free time you have. <laughs> no problem. I'm blessed to be here.